crush the diabetic. Paul's desire was to go to Rome. This is why he wrote the book of Romans. He says here in verse eight, chapter one, he says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. He's proud of the Roman people. He had never been there, but he was writing to them and, and sharing the gospel with them and teaching them how to live out their faith. He says, for God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching of the gospel of his son is my witness as, as to how unceasingly I make mention of you. He's not just someone who just comes uh, and wants to go on mission somewhere just to share the gospel, uh, but he loves the people that he's sharing with. He loves to, he, he's a father. It says that, you know, there are many teachers, it says in 1 Corinthians 4, 15, but there are very few fathers and Paul is that father uh, of, to, to the nations. He says, always in my prayers making requests, if perhaps now at last by the will of God I may succeed in coming to you, for I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. That was our heart's cry that God, would you put a love in our heart for the people of Rome? It may not just be another thing, you know, another place to go to, another stamp in our passport, but it may be a place where we can actually have a, a, a place where we can impact a nation and we can impact a family and, and begin to build a relationship with, with them for the long haul. It says that, that is that I may, be I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us, by the other's faith, both yours and mine. In other words, he knew that as he went, he would be encouraged by their faith and he knew that he would encourage their faith. He was longing to impart some sort of gift to them, some sort of blessing to them, um, but he knew that he would receive a blessing back. And that's just how it is on mission, isn't it? And so Paul is longing to go to this place to do those things. And then he says, he's actually under obligation, or he says, he he's also says, I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are also in Rome. And for I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, first for the Jew and also for the Greek, for it is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, for it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. This gospel has changed Rome um, because of Paul's prayers, because of his willingness to go and be in the incarnation of Christ, to actually go, not just speak the word um, from a distance and writing a letter, but actually be there in person so that he can bless this church. And that now we get to see 2000 years later, we are also blessed by this amazing book called Romans. All right, in Acts 27, you remember in verse one, where they decided then to bring Paul to Italy and they then had a massive shipwreck Paul prayed, gave orders to the people to stay on the ship. They made it safely. God came through for them. And then you see that they went to Malta. And then in verse 11, it says, at the end of the three months, they had set, set sail on an Alexandrian ship, which had wintered in the island, and which had the twin brothers for its figurehead. And it says in verse 12, after we had put in at Syracuse, or Syracuse, which is in Sicily, and then they stayed there for three days, and then went through Regium, and then Puteoli, which is where Naples is. A lot of our guys actually just spent some time in Naples. And then they found some brethren, invited them to stay with them for seven days. And then and then uh, Luke says, and then they came to Rome. It's like for all the readers to be like, ah, oh, finally, Paul's in Rome. This is his dream. This is where he wanted to be. This is when he wrote uh, when he wrote to the Romans. He's like, I want to see you. I want to impart something to you. And then uh, in verse 15, it says that they went to the market of Appius and then the three inns, which is 30 miles right outside the city. And uh, it was so cool. Just um, this week, we got to go as a family in a bike ride uh, to the Appian Way, which is the oldest road in, uh, in the world. Um, it's, it's about 300 BC that this road was created and they did nothing to the road. It's the exact same road that Paul himself walked on, which is so cool that we got to actually do that. And then he made his way into the central part of the city there uh, and next to the Colosseum. That's where Paul was tried. And then uh, he was put under house arrest. In Acts 28, uh, Paul is making his journey into Rome. And it says here, when they entered Rome in verse 16 of chapter 28 of Acts, it says Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. In other words, he was under house arrest. So he was, he, he was under house arrest, which means that he had a little bit of freedom. He wasn't in the cell, uh, as we see when he was gonna die under Nero. But so he was able to write, he was able to meet with people. In fact, it says he invited some of, when, when a day had been set for Paul, in verse 23, they came to him at his lodging in large numbers and he was explaining to him to them the gospel. And then, it, then he took some time to write what we know are the prison epistles, which are Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians and Philemon. Um, and those are the letters that are so dear to us today.
Okay, well, this is the place where Paul, in his dying days, uh, wrote 2 Timothy. And he wrote 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and he also wrote Titus, is his last letters. And this is what he says. And I just, I think it's so cool just to see, like, he, like uh, the, the scriptures say in second, or 1 Thessalonians, it says that he's a father. He's, he's, he's a, uh, someone who actually cares about his people. He's not just interested in, in sharing the gospel so that people would be saved, but he's interested, and even what Psalm 127 says, that the Lord is building a house and he cares about his people so much. And his, his last, the last chapter in which Paul writes, he says this, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Isn't that true? I mean, just as, even as I know, like the last 11 years of, of pastoring a church that we planted, it's just, it's great. It's preaching the word, yes, with accuracy and precision, but it's doing it with great patience because that is exactly the quality that, uh, that a dad needs to, to pastor a church or to take care of his family. And it says, for the time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine. And they'll, they're wanting to have their ears tickled and they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, which you see so much today on YouTube and uh, satisfying their own desires. And they will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. And Jesus said that the truth will set us free and, and they turn aside to things that will not fill them. It says, but you, Timothy, the next generation. This is what dads do. They raise up the next generation. This is what Psalm 127 says, that these arrows will be sharpened. These arrows will be aimed. These arrows will be released. Um, and the tip of that is intimacy with God and family and, 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 and missions. It says, but you be sober in all things. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. And 2,000 years later, we're all sitting here in, in a dungeon in Rome because of what Paul's ministry and what he did for us. And it says here that, for I am ready to be poured out like a drink offering. And at the time of my departure as, has come, and I fought the good fight, and I finished the course, and I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me. He knew that this would not be his eternal home, of course not, but that he, there was something better in which he was looking forward to. He says, I fought the good fight. I've finished exactly what God has called me to do here on planet earth and I'm going somewhere better and I'm going to receive this crown of righteousness with the Lord the righteous judge will award me on that day and not only to me but also all of us and everybody listening now will also get to experience as they love Jesus and put their faith in him and then I love this and you can see this in, in my bible here personal concerns it's the last thing that Paul wrote and I love this because he's talking about the pain of people leaving him he's talking about actually he's like hey bring to me in this prison he's like bring to me like like my cloak because I'm cold can you really imagine how cold it'd be here and then also bring to me uh, my, my, my parchments, bring to me the books, bring me the, bring me the word of God. I want to, I want to read. I want to keep my mind occupied. And he's talking about people who abandon him. And then he's talking about his family. He's like, greet Priscilla and Achilla and, uh, and greet those of the, in these different households and Trophimus who I left sick. I'll make, make sure that, um, he's doing well and make every effort to come before winters. And he, he needs visitors as Jesus said, visit those who are in prison. So and the last thing he says in verse 22, the Lord be with you in your spirit. Um, and grace, grace be with you. We're standing right here at what is called Martin Luther Square in the central Rome. It's the only plot given to evangelicals, uh, which is pretty crazy when you think about that because of the control of the Catholic Church. Um, they only gave this plot of land dedicated to the evangelical faith to honor the Reformation and what Martin Luther did. In fact, uh, Martin Luther came here and technically started the Reformation right here from Rome. Um, but it's kind of crazy to think about this, that a man named Martin Luther, he's a monk, uh, dedicated to the Catholic faith, and uh, he early on, he got struck by lightning, felt like he needed to give his life to the Lord. Uh, he gave his life to the Catholic faith, and he took what many people do today, they take a pilgrimage to Rome, and he went to a place called Scalia Santa, which means the Holy Steps, and he saw people go up on their knees. Uh, people would go up on their knees, and, and they, they have to, it's a little sign that says you must go up these steps on your knees. And what happened is they could get their loved ones out of purgatory by praying these prayers as they go up and they would pay some money. And then they would go and they would confess their sins to some of the priests. And Martin Luther was appalled by this. He was thinking, no way, this can't be like what I've given my life to. And so he went back, this is 1505, he went back to Germany and um, he read Ephesians, he read Romans, he read Galatians, he read the Psalms, and this is what one of the passages he probably read uh, and, and just stirred his faith 
uh, um, and, and it says here in Ephesians 2 verses 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as the result of works so that no one may boast for we are in his worksmanship. You know, we can boast when we're going up the steps of the Scalia Santa. We could say, you know, we had, we, we had some contribution to salvation or helping someone get out of purgatory, but there's no way possible. He says, no, it's not by works, but it's by grace that you have been saved. And this is what changed Martin Luther's life. 1517, of course, you know, in Germany, he wrote the 95 Thesis. He just wanted to have a conversation that said, hey, this is what the Bible says, that the just shall live by faith. Let's actually go with what the Bible says, that people are saved through faith in Christ alone uh, and through grace. And what a great gift that Martin Luther gave us to, to just stand firm on the word of God when so many other people are not. All right, guys, hey, we're back at Martin Luther Square. One of the things I want you guys to be praying for is that God would bring a reformation here to Rome. One of the things that uh, Martin Luther got to experience was, yes, he got to start the reformation here because he was so moved by the Scalia Santa. But, you know, even though the, the reformation started here and never flourished here and never made it over the Alps from Germany and Switzerland and France. And so God, may God actually do a miraculous work here in Rome. I mean, Paul from his prison cell, Paul from uh, from writing the book of Romans, um, he, he just desired that the people of, of Italy would know Christ. And that's exactly what we need you guys to pray for. So point number one is please pray for salvations. We've already seen one salvation. It's so exciting. I mean, you guys should applaud for that. I mean, that's a miracle right there. And we pray that that person would be get discipled and followed up with and be a part of the church. Um, and also the second thing I want you guys to pray for is discipleship. We pray that um, Johnny's church would be discipled. We've, we've already been invited um, into many discipleships. It's so cool to see. Um, it was about 40% Hispanic as we've been talking to you guys about for a while now. But a lot of our Hispanic ladies and, and some of the guys, they're like, we want to go and disciple. We want to we want to go up where they live. And and it was so sweet. The, the Hispanic people, they were like, can we find ways to serve you? And we're like, we're here for you. We want to serve you. And so um, for, for guys that are coming on the impact teams, I mean, this is really exciting. If you speak Spanish, just get around them. They need that encouragement. They're refugees from Venezuela and different parts and in, in, in Peru and El Salvador and so they just were they lit up when they saw us that we speak Spanish and that we could actually meet them in their homes and disciple them and and, and reach out to them and pray for them and encourage them so and then the third thing I want you guys to pray for is our team times we want you to pray for our church that, that that God would continue to move in our team times and worship and that the tip of the spear as we've been talking about is the enjoyment with God that we would be a church again of intimacy with God and meeting with him and praying for one another and wanting each other to actually meet with God every day and then also that we would grow in unity uh, as a team um, and that we would continue to have the strength to go out and share the gospel and finish well.